Yeehaw. All right, I'm gonna let everyone in. Good luck, guys. Thanks. Ooh. Let folks connect to audio here. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining. I see folks are still connecting to audio, so we'll give everyone a minute here to get connected and ready. I could ask everyone to please uh, mute their, their audio. I'm getting some background noise. You're going to ask me if I have a second. I know where I'm going. A few more folks joining, so we'll just wait a minute here. Okay. I think we're ready. Thank you everyone for joining tonight for a public meeting regarding the Stinson Beach Adaptation and Resilience Collaboration or the Stinson ARC as you'll hear us call it throughout the evening. My name is Katie Delu. I'm the facilitator for tonight and we'll, uh, we'll introduce the rest of the team shortly in our presentation here. Um, let's get started by reviewing the agenda for our time together tonight. On the next slide, please. So here's our agenda. We have an hour together. Um, we'll start with some overview slides and a welcome, and we'll do some team introductions to let you know who you'll, you'll hear from tonight. Um, we'll, we'll do some guidelines and Zoom logistics, and then we'll move into an overview of the project and Stinson ARC goals. Next, we'll describe the vulnerability assessment findings that our team has been working on, and we'll wrap up the presentation by reviewing next steps for the Stinson ARC. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll open up to a facilitated question and answer session. Next slide, please. I just wanna run through some quick meeting guidelines here. Um, I know many of us have been participating in Zoom meetings for a while now, but just wanna make sure we're all on the same page. Um, some overarching guidelines, we just ask that you be respectful of one another, be patient if there are technical difficulties. We're doing some presentation and video back and forth. so. Um, just ask for a little patience as we work through that. Uh, re please remain muted unless it's your turn to speak, and we'll we'll go through how to do that shortly. Um, and then hold your questions for Q and A at, until the end of the presentation. We want to make sure that we can get through all of the content we have to share with you tonight. Um, when we do get to that Q and A section, and I'll review this again when we get there, I ask you please to raise your hand using the raise hand feature in Zoom if you have a question, and then unmute when I call on you to speak. If you're dialing in by phone, you can dial star nine to raise your hand, and then you'll be asked to unmute when it's your turn, and you can hit star six to unmute to speak. Um, and then another way to ask questions when we get to that portion of the meeting is to use the chat feature in Zoom. And please direct your question to me as the facilitator, and I can get to them when we get, we'll go back and forth between raise hands and the chat, and I can facil facilitate that for us. Next slide, please. And then again, I know many of us are familiar with Zoom, but just to make sure, I um, wanted to show just a couple quick tools for you to use while we're in the Zoom together. Um, you have the mute button, make sure that you are muted while, when it's not your turn to speak and unmute when it is. Um, there's the chat button there. You can direct tech support questions to CDA Media Tech and the questions that you have about the presentation to me as your facilitator. There's a closed caption feature. If you would like to use closed caption, you can click on that to have the captions transcribed live and just want to acknowledge that we don't have a person actually doing the transcripting, the transcribing tonight, it's automated. So bear with us if there's any errors in that. Um, and then finally, there's a reactions button. And if you click reactions, that's how you'll see the raise hand feature if you wanted to ask a question in the Q&A section. Next slide, please. And then just to give an overview of who all is part of the Stinson ARC and who's here with us today, um, we have Isaac Perlman from the Marin County Community Development Agency. He's our project manager. Uh, Jack Leapster is also the planning man manager, recently retired, maybe on Zoom tonight. Um, you'll be hearing from Isaac for the presentation. 
And then as part of the consultant team, I have myself, I'm your facilitator for tonight. James Jack Jackson is our civil and coastal engineer who you'll be hearing from in the presentation. Marlis Jean is with us tonight also, and she's taking great notes so we can make sure that we have a good summary of our meeting tonight. And then a whole variety of other folks listed here, including Marie Rainwater, Rich Souza, Phil King, a firm called Blue Point Blue, Brad Demitz, and Giuliano Khalil, who are all really important parts of our team that offer specific expertise and round out what we need to, to do this great project, the Stinson Arc. And then before we get into the meat of our presentation, we wanted to know a little bit about who's with us tonight. So I have just a really quick poll to launch for you. The question is, what is your connection to Stinson Beach? The responses that you can pick from are, I visit Stinson Beach, I'm a Stinson Beach resident or homeowner, my work is related to Stinson Beach or general interest. Please make your selection and I'll give 30 seconds here to let you do that. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. It looks like we have a pretty good spread of folks. Um, some, some, of e some in each category. I definitely have some residents or homeowners here, folks who are doing work in Stinson Beach, and a few folks who visit Stinson Beach. So it's great to have you all with us tonight. Thank you so much. There's our results for you. Thanks, everybody. And next, I'd like to hand it over to Isaac um, to walk us through uh, some overview slides about what the Stinson Arc is. And you need to unmute, Isaac, please. The old unmute. Um, thanks, Katie. Yeah, so as Katie mentioned, my name is Isaac Perlman. Uh, I'm a planner with Marin County um, and managing the Stinson Arc project. So the Stinson Arc, the arc of Stinson Arc is adaptation and resilience collaboration. And so basically, simply what this project is, it's a planning, it's a grant funded planning process to help Stinson stakeholders address sea level rise. Um, the first step of this process uh, was for us to update the previous sea level rise study that was done out of Stinson. The last one was done in 2016. So we wanted to update that with it some of the she, latest she science. Um, and, uh, and so the results of that update are what we're going to be presenting to you all tonight. The next phase of this project is working with that um, expert team that Katie just showed you all. Um, to really investigate and um, analyze what's possible out in Stinson in terms of adaptation measures, um, as well as how they could look as into at, as how they could work together as part of an adaptation pathway, which James will get more into um, what that is uh, later in the presentation. And then uh, la the last phase of this project will be developing an adaptation plan or roadmap which will include implementation steps, um, as well as a monitoring approach and exploring uh, potential funding mechanisms. So why is this project needed? Well, for, I, for most of you, I think, who are familiar with Stinson, um, you probably know that flooding is, is nothing new to the community and the beach out there. Just this past winter alone, uh, Stinson Beach had some uh, damage from storm waves on January 5th. Um, East Coop Creek over flooded its banks in late December, and Stinson also experienced some, um, some tidal and groundwater flooding. So uh, what our study shows and what James is going to talk more about is if we don't take any action, um, our models show that all of those types of flooding is will get much worse with sea level rise. And, what that translates into is increased flooding of not just homes and properties, but also infrastructure in Stinson, like roads and utilities, and um, also loss of beach and marsh habitat, which is what draws a lot of people to Stinson Beach. 
So as this pro uh, part of this project, we'll be doing ex extensive uh, stakeholder outreach, and there's a lot of stakeholders for Stinson Beach. So the groups that we're um, trying to talk to include obviously the community, the people living out there, um, but also land and critical infrastructure managers. And so that group includes um, agencies like the National Park Service who manage um, quite a bit of the beach as well as Marin County Parks, which manages um, part of the beach and Bolinas Lagoon, as well as other um, agencies like the Stinson Beach Water District and Caltrans who manages Highway 1. Um, so other um, important stakeholders and partners in this project include regulatory agencies and technical experts, and they're going to be the ones who are, who are going to help us identify and understand what's feasible out in Stinson, um, as well as beach visitors. Um, one of the early parts of this project was to do a study with the aforementioned Point Blue uh, to look at how many people use Stinson Beach, and they estimate Stinson Beach gets up to um, anywhere from 600 to 750,000 visitors per year. Um, other key stakeholders include Stinson businesses, as well as environmental organizations that are doing a lot of conservation work out in Stinson. So for a look at our process and timeline, um, as I mentioned, our first step is doing that, is updating that previous study, um, which we're about to present the results to you. Uh, the next phase and most of the rest of this year will be working with that expert team to identify and and really investigate, like I said, what what adaptation measures are possible for Stinson Beach. Um, phase three, and which will be next year, will be uh, packaging that information and analysis together as part of a draft adaptation roadmap, um, and then. After that will then come the final. And the reason we kind of distinguish between draft and final is, as you see on the arrow on the right, um, we're doing stakeholder engagement throughout the process. So there are going to be in each of these phases key opportunities for everyone to give um, to give us feedback. All right, so with that, um, I will hand it over to James Jackson, who's the lead engineer from Environmental Science Associates on this project. Thanks, Isaac. But yeah, we're gonna give an overview of the vulnerability assessment findings. So please. The county conducted a um, countywide vulnerability assessment back in 2016, looking at the full Pacific coastline. And so uh, at a higher level and specifically the update for the Stinson Arc addresses the sea level rise and storm scenarios we consider to evaluate what is exposed. Um, we've uh, taken another look at the assets and resource information, particularly bringing that together into GIS to evaluate what is exposed to different types of hazards in the community. And the update also um, adds a couple of additional hazards uh, to cover the full range of coastal hazards that are anticipated in the community. Next slide, please. For this study, we're looking at three future sea level rise amounts in addition to today's sea level, and that is 1.6 feet, 3.3 feet, and 6.6 .6 feet. This table shows the relative timing or the years that these projections might occur based on the latest science and state guidance for sea level rise planning for a community-wide adaptation plan, such as the Stinson Beach Arc. Next slide. Today we're in 2023. Here's an overview graphic uh, showing the, the various GIS information we've collected to show assets in the community, and, and that includes developed areas, residential buildings, businesses, other important structures such as the fire station, lifeguard station, water district office, uh, the roads that support the community, as well as the natural environment and those resources, which as Isaac mentioned, you know, draw a lot of visitors to the community, wetlands and beaches. And so we've taken all this information and with GIS overlaid the various hazards and come up with what we call exposed assets. And we talk about their, the vulnerabilities of these assets in the report. 
Next slide. The anticipated hazards at Stinson Beach uh, are familiar with uh, for those who have you know, been to the community. And we're looking at a, a full range of hazards to characterize just the regular conditions uh, as well as potential extreme events. And so we're looking at exposure to monthly high tides, like the spring tides that occur uh, every month, as well as 100 year storm impacts or an extreme storm that has a 1% chance of occurring in any given year. For the, these extreme events, we're looking at the coastal flooding, um, high water, storm surge, high tides in the lagoon, as well as wave runup along the beach side of the community. We've updated coastal erosion projections, looking at the movement of the shoreline with sea level rise, as well as the back of the beach where there's a dune and the erosion of those dunes to estimate what the future beach widths might uh, look like with sea level rise. Uh, a notable update with this assessment is the inclusion of groundwater information. Um, this has become available since the time of the uh, countywide vulnerability assessment. So we're looking at rising groundwater levels and emergent groundwater, which are uh, very important to the community, as well as East Coot Creek flooding. As Isaac mentioned, the Creek flooded over its banks this past winter. And so that, that's an additional hazard source for the community. Next slide. Right now, I will allow Isaac to play a short video uh, that gives a, a high level summary in a um, more interactive environment for us to all watch for a few minutes here. All right. And bear me, bear with me, everyone. I had a little bit of difficulty doing this when we were practicing, but I think we can do it. So, and Katie, hopefully you can just give me a thumbs up if uh, um, if this is working and if the sound is working. See the video. And we hear it. Welcome to Stinson Beach. This small community of about 500 people is located north of San Francisco in Marin County, just across the Golden Gate Bridge. Its broad sandy beach is one of the most popular in Northern California attracting 750,000 visitors per year to swim, surf, and enjoy the coastal climate. Nestled between the Pacific Ocean and Bolinas Lagoon, the Stinson Beach area was used by the Coast Miwok people for over 10,000 years, who built boats and homes from willows and tule reeds. After European colonization, Stinson's sandy peninsula developed from tent camps to permanent beach houses over the last 150 years. If no action is taken, the community will remain vulnerable to future flooding from sea level rise. This is a 3D model of Stinson Beach. Here you can see the creek and lagoon, the beach houses, as well as Highway 1 and the Calle de Arroyo access road. Let's take a look at how sea level rise could impact Stinson. With just 1.6 feet of sea level rise, Stinson's streets and homes are at risk from lagoon side flooding. With no action, portions of these important access roads will permanently flood with even just a foot or two of sea level rise. Along with vulnerable underground utilities like water and septic, this impacts all residents, regardless of their home elevation. At 3.3 feet of sea level rise, some of these critically important wetlands are now permanently covered by water. On the ocean side, rising waters are increasing shoreline erosion and beach loss. After 6.6 .6 feet of sea level rise, flooding impacts nearly the entire Stinson Beach Peninsula, 
from the lagoon to the ocean. A previous study by Marin County showed that several hundred properties are at risk of flooding in the next few decades. Let's go to a bird's eye view to understand what this means. Here's East Coot Creek. Normally it wends its way quietly into Bolinas Lagoon. But when there is heavy rain in the steep upper watershed, that water runs downhill to the coast and the creek channel gets overwhelmed. This has happened several times in the past decade. For example, the New Year's Eve storm of 2005 caused East Coot Creek to overflow and flood several dozen homes. Here's the area that a 100-year flood would cover today. This kind of flood has a 1% chance of happening every year, or a 26% chance during a 30-year mortgage. Even without sea level rise, this extreme storm scenario would flood an estimated 50 homes, in addition to affecting local restaurants and public access to beach parking. With climate change, the odds of simultaneous flooding from both the lagoon and Iskut Creek increases. Here is Bolinas Lagoon, a cherished nature preserve that is an important bird sanctuary on the Pacific Flyway, with rare wetland habitat home to a number of endangered and sensitive species. However, as sea level rises, the rich wetland ecosystem changes to mudflats and eventually open water. With nowhere to go, the plants and animals that rely on the wetland are squeezed out. Additionally, the natural flood protection that the wetland provides for nearby homes is lost, resulting in more flooding in the community. On a sunny weekend day, the beach is packed with visitors. However, due to sea level rise and coastal erosion, Stinson's Beach is gradually lost to the rising ocean. Over time, this means less beach area and access for visitors, lower tourism revenue, and without any action, the decline of one of Marin County's most beloved beaches. So what can we do to protect Stinson Beach from these future scenarios? Stinson partners are already carrying out short and midterm solutions and studies to decrease flood risk and buy the community more time. From utility upgrades to exploring protective dune and living levee feasibility, the community is starting to plan for higher water levels. Working together, we can make Stinson resilient to future flooding. Marin County is now embarking on a project to explore the feasibility of a range of long-term adaptation strategies for Stinson Beach. A team of scientists, engineers, and economists will work with local partners and stakeholders to evaluate how a series of adaptation options can reduce flood impacts over time as part of adaptation pathways. This planning effort is known as the Stinson Adaptation and Resilience Collaboration and you're invited to join us. Stay tuned for part two, exploring Stinson Beach adaptation possibilities. Okay, <clears throat> back to you, James. Thanks, Isaac. So uh, what I want to do after that video is, is just focus on uh, today's vulnerabilities to the various hazards we're evaluating for the study and look at this first sea level rise scenario of 1.6 feet, which is for planning purposes projected uh, at 2050. And as we've been discussing, you know, today there's a lot of uh, vulnerabilities to coastal hazards in the community. Homes and properties specifically, uh, there are 240 plus buildings at risk from a 100 year coastal storm, whether it's flooding on the lagoon side or wave run up on the beach. And additionally, there's 120 buildings at risk from the 100 year flood in East Coot Creek. With sea level rise of just a foot, about a foot and a half, uh, we have inundation of 
most of the Calle's roads in the community and uh, 450 buildings at risk from that 100 year coastal flooding event. And beaches and dunes, today there are explorers to you know, periodic storm erosion, such as uh, the recent El Nino storms and the erosion in, during the storm back in January of this year. And with a foot and a half of sea level rise, we're looking at about a third of a, a reduction in that summer beach width. And with further sea level rise, the beaches will continue to shrink until limited to some pocket beaches in the patios area, which have some existing erodible dunes, as well as the National Park Service reach, which has a lot more space for the shoreline to move with sea level rise. And marshes today, uh, focusing on the Stinson vicinity, are limited to the lower East Goot Creek floodplain and some narrow bands of marsh uh, between the homes and roads in the Linus Lagoon. With sea level rise of just a foot point six feet, we could see a, approximately a 40% reduction in marsh plain habitats. Uh, as these marshes have you know, limited space to migrate upland with sea level rise, we've got development in the community and roads on the other side of the lagoon and on the hillside there. Shoreline Highway is exposed to coastal storm surge in a couple of locations along the length of the segment next to Bolinas Lagoon. And with 1.6 feet of sea level rise, a cumulative of about two thirds of a mile are exposed to monthly tides. And so those, those are broken up in, in a few different locations, but a significant amount of the roadway being exposed by just the highest tides of the month. And uh, the last category is septic systems and utilities. Today, around 480 parcels are at risk from seasonally high groundwater and the issues that it poses to the septic systems. And most of the community or all of the community is on septic systems, which require a, a certain amount of space of earth beneath those septic systems to properly treat wastewater. So as groundwater levels rise, the risk of failure of these septic systems also rise and uh, poses additional risks to other at-grade um, utilities, you know, utility connections around homes and uh, trenches, et cetera, in the community. And with additional sea level rise, these, uh, these problems just become worse. And so that's why we're here today. That's what we're focused on is identifying solutions and helping the community to chart a path forward. So next slide. So what are some of the potential adaptation measures that um, could apply in Stinson Beach? This is just an example. Um, we're gonna be embarking on the next step and getting into more detail here, but just to iterate some examples, you know, elevating homes that are in the floodplain, uh, whether you're in the wave zone or in another floodplain zone, whether it's alongside the lagoon or along the creek, uh, coastal armoring along the beach, um, flood walls are, are um, there's a couple of flood walls that exist uh, along the Linus Lagoon in the Sea Drift community, pump stations to pump out storm waters and flood waters, and the, and the list goes on, and including nature-based solutions like maintaining and restoring beaches, um, you know, uh, improving marsh perimeter habitat around the community with some transitional slopes uh, to, to help both the ecosystem as well as provide some flood protection value. And also looking at you know, upgrading utilities lines, you know, reconfiguring uh, how the, the community um, treats its wastewater and other measures such as relocation or realignment roads, facilities, buildings. So looking into the next steps of the project, we'll be developing adaptation pathways that highlight uh, potential options through time with sea level rise for the community in terms of addressing these various hazards, coastal erosion, regular tidal inundation, extreme flooding and wave flooding, groundwater. So what is an adaptation pathway? It's sort of a, um, you know, a, a hypothetical 
root of what, what is done through time. And so a pathway consists of potential adaptation measures or individual tools such as you know, restoring a dune or raising a home above a floodplain. And these specific measures are implemented through time triggered by increasing hazards. So if a community area is more susceptible to flooding today, then they, they would need to be implementing such measures in the near term and perhaps other higher ground areas. They wouldn't need to implement something like raising homes until a few decades from now. So an adaptation pathway responds to these projected conditions that we identify in the vulnerability assessment and compiles a pathway forward drawing from the range of available measures. Dealing with the homes uh, requires one, one set of measures, uh, raising the roads and the utilities is another set of measures, et cetera. And so these pathways will identify steps through time based on the projected sea level rise we're considering for the study and include strategic timing. There's time needed to plan, design, and permit types of projects. So that we call that a lead time that's needed before something needs to be implemented. And in this pathways analysis, we'll also be identifying potential funding sources, next steps for implementation, and specific monitoring approaches to um, you know, understand thresholds for needing to upgrade a septic system, for example, we would monitor the groundwater level, waiting for that groundwater level to come up to a, an intolerable um, threshold, or watching the beaches and monitoring the beach widths throughout uh, the winter. And when a beach width passes down below a threshold, that tr could trigger an act adaptation action. Next slide. So I believe I'll be passing this back to Isaac here. Yes, <laughs> thanks James. Um, so I already went through our timeline previously, uh, so I'm not gonna kind of go over it again, but this is just a reminder of what we're looking at for this stints in our uh, planning process going through 2024. Um, and now just the last kind of slide I'll go over and of our presentation, we'll just be looking at our um, upcoming opportunities to engage with this project. So we, as I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of stakeholders out, out there for Stinson. And so there's a lot of ways um, for you all to get involved um, and, and give us feedback on this project. One is right now, we're about to, I'm about to um, hand it back over to Katie and we're gonna do Q and A. So we're looking forward to hearing your feedback and questions now. Um, you're always welcome to go to the web, our Stinson Arc website um, and leave, it, leave a comment for us there. Um, and I should say we're, we are gonna be sharing um, these slides with everybody um, on the website. Um, we're putting together some focus groups for this project, and we're actually still looking for some uh, diverse participants for our equity focus group. So if you or someone you know visits Stinson Beach and is from an underserved marine population, please get in touch with me. My email is going to be on the next slide um, if you'd like to participate in one of those focus groups. Uh, we're also going to be doing at least one, if not more, um, pop-ups this summer to engage Stinson Beach visitors. Um, that same video that you just saw, we have um, available in virtual reality. So if anyone is actually out in Stinson, um, I'll be there tomorrow at the Stinson Beach Library um, at 11 a.m. with a couple VR headsets um, in which you can kind of explore um, those simulations and what they look like. So everyone's welcome to come out to that. Um, all of that information is on our website, um, but to kind of get into just a little bit, the next phase of our project is, as, I, as we talked about, it's evaluating what's, what adaptation measures are possible out in Stinson. Um, we're gonna be working with our technical team on that and then coming back with a draft um, to stakeholders to get feedback from you. And so that'll be kind of taking us through 2023. Once we've gotten feedback, we'll be looking at putting those measures, as James was talking about, into an adaptation pathway. Um, so 
Uh, again, that will then be packaged into a draft report, which we will then give uh, stakeholders another chance to look at, give us comments and feedback before we make that a final. So um, I think that's it. Uh, I will hand it back over to Katie to kick off our Q&A. Awesome, thank you. Um, will you go to the next slide, Isaac? I just, before we go into Q&A, I just wanna run through one more time very quickly, ask that um, we do have a hard stop. Well, I do wanna say we have a hard stop at 6.30 and we're happy to answer questions until then. But because of that hard stop, really wanna make sure that everyone um, is brief and clear with your questions and that if folks have already spoken, maybe you can get, if you could please give somebody else a chance to speak if there are more questions. Um, raise your, you can raise your hand with the raise hand feature and unmute when I call on you. Um, and if you're dialing by phone, again, that's star nine to raise your hand and then star six to unmute, or you can use the chat feature in Zoom to direct your question to me and um, we'll call on you when we see it. Hey. And I see uh, Kalak at Comcast.net. Um, you have your hand raised. Would you like to answer, ask a question? Sure. Um... Two or three years ago, the uh, County Planning Commission and the Coastal Commission uh, issued a number of possible regulations concerning homeowners in Stinson Beach and, and these kinds of, of worries. And they were going to be very, very costly fixes that individual homeowners had to take. Uh, is, is that uh, effort uh, no longer viable and, and being supplanted by this ARC or is that still out there? Um, question. I think, yeah, I would like to go ahead. Yeah, I, I think, I, I think maybe are you talking about the 2018 kind of Marin Outer Coast Adaptation Report that looked at a lot of different kind of high level adaptation possibilities? It um, could have been that, and it was a combination of the County Planning Commission series of rules and the Coastal Commission and fights between the two of them as to which ones had to be followed, but they ended up with a, a lot of the homeowners being um, impacted financially in a huge way and, and fighting it. And then nothing ever came of it. And I wondered where that's gone. Yeah, I, I'd i love to chat with you more because I'm not that that sounds to be maybe like the local coastal plan update process. But to yes. be honest, I'm not right. The coastal yeah. plan update process. How does that fit with this? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. So they are separate processes. Um, and um, there's another county staff person who's working through that LCP, as we call it, update process. Uh, I could try and find more information out uh, about that process if you're interested. So feel free to please get in touch with me. But the difference between the two processes are that is a regulatory process, which, as you mentioned, like will significantly impact um, what's what's allowed to happen. What we're working on this Stinson Arc, pro Stinson Arc pro uh, process is a planning, it's a non-regulatory planning process. So they're distinct. Okay. We're just looking at possibilities and then carrying forward. Um, I think you had, a, there was one question about cost. One of the things we will be looking at towards the end of this project, once we've already kind of had our technical team look at what's possible, what adaptation measures are possible, is we will be looking at costs. So okay. I hope that answered your question. But I, like I said, happy to follow up more with you. Um, All right, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks so much. I'm going to ask a question I see in the chat. Someone is curious to know what the January storms were considered to be, as in, were they 50 year storms or possibly more? With the comment that warming oceans cause greater swells. That's something we're able to I answer. Think James, I think James could probably talk about that. Yeah, we, we haven't um, quantified the storm and impacts uh, with technical analysis as, as we would typically do, but I, I did look at the available tide gauges and wave buoys after that event. And the tide at the point raise gauge uh, reached a peak level of about the two year tide. So a little higher than a king tide. 
um, during during the course of those storms and the swells offshore swells was, was very large you know at 30 feet off from a far offshore um, but as I saw from some weather reporting swells in the Stinson Beach area reached 15 or, or more feet um, along the shore so you know it was a it was a high tide um, speaking of just the, the typical tides so we had a, a big wave event impacting at the same time as some pretty high tides. So as we saw a lot of a lot of erosion and flooding along the shore, and there was also a lot of uh, rain um, during that same time. So groundwater levels came up. So it, it was a it was a combination of, of factors, um, but we haven't quantified per se the occurrence of that event if it was a ten year, fifty year event. Awesome. Thanks, James. Mallory, I see your hand. Would you like to ask a question? Oh, let me un. Can you please unmute? Thank you. There you go. Um, is there a priority about uh, in terms of what, whether it's the septic or the beach, or uh, is there any, has anybody figured out what they want to do first that would be the most effective? for not only the people uh, on the beach, but uh, around in all of Stinson? Um, yeah, uh, so I think if I understand your question, like, are you asking what gets impacted first or no, what you, is uh, the priority what, what, in terms of What you prioritize, responses? yeah, what, what, what you're gonna work on in what order? Is there like an order of uh, priority for, um, what, what, you know, what happens next? Yeah, I, James, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the process for kind of evaluating adaptation strategies. Sure. Yeah. Um, so at this point, we've identified what's exposed and when with respect to sea level rise. Um, but we'll really be getting to answer to that question more specifically, Mallory, as we get into the the analysis on our adaptation measures. Um, as we develop the list, you know, we're, we're gonna pull from the available measures that we know as practitioners and line those up with the, the hazards. You've got a, certain types of actions for erosion and for groundwater issues for flooding, and we'll time those out and, and do an analysis. And in that process, we'll identify, you know, wh what are the, the critical you know, things to do first? We haven't uh, formalized a list yet of priorities, but that will be an outcome in our adaptation plan roadmap. It'll prioritize what actions uh, are needed first, um, but the community is subject to a number of, of hazards. So there will likely be a, a few priorities, septics uh, being one, maintaining access um, for the community. Those, those seem like very important priorities just from the, the vulnerability assessment findings but we'll be coming up with a more a formal list of prioritized adaptation actions. With okay, and thank you. And and I'm glad I, I, I like the first two, um, personally for me, but also, uh, is there any help from the government, either the federal government or the California government to help do this? In terms of funding and implementation? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Mallory, for the question. Yeah, so this, as I mentioned earlier, it's a grant-funded process. So uh, one of the biggest um, uh, funding sources for this project is from the California Ocean Protection Council. So so state state funds um, are, are contributing a lot to this process. We also have some federal grant money as well. Um, so we are definitely getting support from them. And then actually, if I could just uh, like go back um, a little bit to your first question, I wanted to say there are, um, I, and acknowledge that there are a lot of at sea level rise adaptation projects and plans already happening in Stinson. So we are trying to support those. The, Na the National Park Service, for example, has been doing a lot of work around East Coo Creek flooding. Um, and so they released a study last year, which we were able to use in our report, like some of their updated um, data. And they're looking at um, kind of redoing the parking lot design to accommodate um, some of that flooding. 
Uh, the Greater Fairlawns Association is looking at a living shoreline project kind of on the back end of the of Bolinas Lagoon. Um, so this and, and we've worked in this report that we just released, we did work with the Stinson Beach County Water District as well, who's who's definitely um, looking at septic systems and how sea level rise impacts them. And did I I kind of remember that they um you know, I think the Calle Los Pinos, they uh, try to fix the, the flooding there. And I don't think it worked very well. Is that going to be addressed as well? Um, when you say they, are you talking about the water district? Wh or? Whomever, whomever is in charge of um, keeping that from flooding and keeping the homes <laughs> on the other side of that parking lot safe. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so the National Park Service has managed the parking lot. If you're talking about the Calle itself, I'd have to yeah. double check and I can follow up, but I believe that might be one of the privately maintained roads. Well, um, not not the road itself, but the the parking is Im impacting that though that Calle. And um they I think they tried to fix it a couple of years ago. Hmm. Um, but I don't think that it was successfully done. Yeah, so, Mallory, let me, I'll, I'll try and see if I can find out the answer and let me, I'll follow up because um, I were, I, I'm in touch with the Park Service quite a bit so I can try and get an answer to that. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for Thanks, all the answers. Mallory, for your question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to go back to the chat here and we have a question um, would you please comment on the sedimentation buildup in the Bolinas Lagoon and what is being done about it and what impact it has on wildlife as well as sea level rise? James, is that something you maybe want to address? Sure. Um, it's complicated. That's my favorite answer. Um, but uh, marshes uh, in lagoons, just as Bolinas, you know, naturally accrete sediment. Uh, both in the fine uh, particulate sediment that settles in the marsh plain, and that's what helps them to build up um, with sea level rise, but there's also potential sedimentation in the channel itself. Uh, our vulnerability assessment looked at marsh habitats and their evolution with sea level rise, and, and that assumed a um, marsh accretion or a, a rate of marsh growth vertically of about 6.8 millimeters per year. Uh, and so that, that can help sustain marshes uh, in the near term, but sea level rise quickly outpaces sedimentation. And that's why we see um, in, in modeling, you know, a conversion of those marsh plant, that vegetated marsh habitat over time with advanced sea level rise will slowly convert to mud flat and open water. Um, and so, Sedimentation is is a natural um, you know, a natural part of wetland systems and and good for the habitat, but it's it's not quite enough on its own to keep up with the uh, higher amounts of sea level rise. That address the question adequately. Thanks, James. I have another question in the chat. When you evaluate adaptation options. What circumstances do you expect would cause the consideration of structure removal, managed retreat to rise to the top as a preferred option? Um, do you want I'm to not, I'll, I'll try to, to, <laughs> I'll James, try to start on this. Yeah, um, I was gonna say, if you wanna talk about the criteria, maybe. Um, yeah, so it, as we compile the list of adaptation individual tools, known as adaptation measures, uh, we'll be evaluating them at a high level with uh, a number of criteria, including cost and feasibility to construct, environmental impact uh, and benefits to the environment, the flood protection and, and other, other criteria that capture the, the range of views um, on the coast, whether you are a homeowner or you're a visitor. And so we'll be able to rank at a high level these, these various adaptation measures and say, you know, uh, for example, uh, an armoring structure helps for erosion protection and potentially flood protection, um, but at, at the detriment of the beach. So there's a quite a environmental impact associated with such a measure. So 
we'll, we'll put out all the, the measures in a large matrix that could work at Stinson and have such a discussion and, and ranking for these different criteria that'll help us to understand the trade-offs with different measures. And we'll compile at, at, at some, compile the measures into an adaptation pathway that is uh, you know, reasonable and, and representative of what's possible. Um, but the, the outcome of our study won't be preferences, but um, you know, priorities so, such as you know, we, we need to address the issue of groundwater. Um, we, won't, we won't be assigning what the future is, but the, the, the real goal of this adaptation roadmap is to create a document that helps the community and stakeholders move forward and plan and, and reach consensus with themselves as moving forward on individual adaptation projects. Great. Thank you, James. Uh, one more question in the chat about the video. Um, someone observed that the homes in Sea Drift were not depicted as part of the video and wanted to know if there was a reason for that. And I think I think that um, it might have been when the narrator mentioned the beach homes. I, I think they just highlighted what was on the, the beach side. Um, yeah, just for, just for narration purposes, but. We're including all the homes in, in the study and we'll be developing measures and pathways that consider the entire uh, community. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I mean, like James said, the report, uh, which is on our website, looks at all, all areas in, of Stinson, including Sea Drift. One of the reasons why that video focuses kind of more on the Calles area is uh, I we worked with the sub consultant um, virtual planet technologies and we couldn't we couldn't do a 3D model of the entire peninsula so we did have to focus a little bit on um, the Calles area in the video and it was kind of it we chose that because it was the intersection of a lot of different um, flood impacts so not just the homes but also it. it that location allowed us to show the lagoon as well as the beach and the creek. Um, but as I said, the report, um, and as James mentioned, the report looks at impacts to all areas of Stinson, um, including Cedric. Great, thank you both. Um, another question we received is what has been the sea level rise over the last 50 years? Is that something we're able to provide a response on? Maybe James? Got me. I, I I can't recall off the top of my head. Perhaps a few inches, um, but I'd be happy to to uh, follow up with a more uh, accurate response. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, another question we have here is whether armoring on the beachfront with seawalls is feasible, um, given the resistance that the Coastal Commission has shown to this. Yeah, uh, well, the other criteria I didn't mention was uh, regula uh, regulatory, um, the category of regulatory issues and constraints. So uh, under that criteria, a seawall uh, or armoring structure would rank poorly as if highly complicated or infeasible um, under the, considering the regulatory um, constraints with armoring. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're we're not at the point right now where we can say what's feasible and what's not, but that's why we have the team of experts to look at all the strategies that we talked about across that criteria that James was saying to say. Um, and one of one of our um, consultants is a regulatory expert. So they're going to be doing the analysis to say um, what scores highly in terms of regulatory feasibility versus lowly. But yeah. Um, but we can at, at this point, we're looking forward to see seeing what happens and what the results are. Thank you. And I just want to mention that we have five minutes of our meeting left. Um, I see another question in the chat, but if anyone else has questions that have not yet been asked, um, now would be the time to raise your hand or put them in the chat with our last five minutes here. Um, the next question is, if groundwater if groundwater rise is a major issue and one likely adaptation is to suggest or mandate raising septic leach fields, 
who would pay those costs with this fall to individual homeowners? That is one of the, um, one of the things we'll focus on in, in our adaptation plan is for the different measures that we come up with, uh, funding mechanisms for, for various adaptation measures will we'll compile it. A, a section in, the, in our report to, to speak to that. So we're not there yet, um, but we'll be we'll be doing some work and pulling from our team of experts to to highlight what are the potential funding mechanisms for adaptation in Stinson. Yeah, like awesome. James said, we sorry just to add on. So again, that long slide of uh, team members that Katie showed in the beginning, one of them is an economist, Phil King. So he's going to be helping us evaluate costs of different strategies. Great. Thank you. And that's the last question I have. I'm just going to scroll and make sure I didn't miss anything here. If there's anyone who hasn't asked a question yet, now's your chance if you would like to. Otherwise, I think we're going to close up for the evening. All right, we really appreciate everyone taking the time to be with us tonight and um, learning more about the Stinson Arc and asking your great questions. Um, as Isaac said, if there are other questions or if you have other thoughts you wanna share, please do um, visit the website. There's a place to, there's a comment form there through which you can submit questions and comments. And also the video that we watch together is posted on the website. So, and we'll be posting the presentation from our meeting tonight on the website as well. Um, so thanks everyone. Hope you have a great evening. Thanks everyone for taking the time. We appreciate thanks it. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, thank you, Mallory. <laughs>